Welcome to another of Bushnell's spectacular and photon explorations. If you don't know much about stars, constellations, distances, or the ancient stories and modern explanation for what's up there, <laughs> consider yourself lucky. Why? Because you have a universe of excitement waiting for you just outside your door and above your head, many trillion miles above your head. This tape is meant to support the information in your star machine's instructional action guide. If you haven't read the guide yet, read the first three pages, then come back to this part of the tape. We'll talk to you when you finish. Okay, by now you know how to turn on your star machine. That's right. After putting the two C batteries in the base and two AA batteries in the pointer, you're ready for action. You also know how to set up your machine for a certain time of year. If you've ever been to a large science museum, you might have visited the Star Theater or Planetarium. Well, your star machine is related to those huge projectors which whirl and spin in the darkness while you sit in your deep, comfortable seat. In its own way, your projector is just as awesome. I guess we could call your star machine a stellarium, just as easy as we can name it a planetarium, since it projects stars and not planets. Of course, it's always good to know more than one name for something, so let's use any of the four names. Star machine, stellarium, planetarium, or projector. No matter what we call it, the star machine can help you learn star names fairly quickly. Why is it important to know star names? Well, for the same reasons that people have names. If you know the name of a person, it helps you remember them when they are out of sight for a while. You can also talk about them with another friend, simply by mentioning the person's name. Try this mind experiment. Think of a good friend's name, a person whom you haven't seen for several weeks. What kind of mental pictures does the name create in your brain? I'll bet that you can almost see the person in your mind. Maybe you can even construct the scene in which you last met. It's fantastic, isn't it? Somehow, once we teach ourselves the name of something or someone, our brain keeps the memory fresh for a long, long time. So that is one reason that we should learn the names of the brighter stars and constellations as projected by your star machine or as seen in the night sky. Let's try another experiment. Hold the stellarium against your stomach. Face a white wall about four feet away. Then turn on the projector switch. Remove a constellation mask if necessary. The room you're projecting in should be dark or dimly lit for best results. Wow, Whew. what a view. There are 312 stars shining on your wall. That's about as many as you can see on any clear night from most populated areas in America. If there aren't too many lights. Or if the moon is not full. When I first tried this, I was totally baffled. I could not recognize constellations because there were just too many stars. That's why the constellation masks are so important. They limit the number of stars and constellations to only those you can see at the time. So very important to learn only one or two constellations and star names each time you use your machine. You'll find that your star selector beam helps to zero in on a star with a red arrow. The star could be one that you want to show your friends. The beam is also terrific for tracing the pattern of a constellation. Remember, the purpose of your star machine is to help you learn about the real sky outside. It's the real night sky. That's where all the action is taking place. You'll believe this after you see your first shooting star flashing across the night sky. Your brain is fantastic at recognizing patterns. For example, listen to this word, sedlek, S-E-D-L-E-C. Recognize it? <laughs> of course not. I'll bet that you knew it was not a word in the English language right away. Somehow your brain knew right away that sedlek is not a word. Scientists do not know how the brain can do this, but that won't stop us from using that pattern power to learn the star patterns called constellations. 
First, we learn them on the star machine, then match them to the constellations in the night sky. It's a piece of cake, right? Let's start by using mask E, the summer constellations. Put the mask on your star machine and turn it on. To begin solving the starry puzzle up there, look for a big triangle with a very bright star at each point. You can tell bright stars from dim stars because they look bigger. You can see the triangle in your guide in the lower left part. That means that it would be in the eastward region of mask E. You see it? If not, shut off the tape and look for it until you do, and then turn me back on. The stars marked A, B, and C in the diagram identify the three brightest stars. You might have to look at your explorer's guide, then at the projected star images, then back to the guide, then back to the stars. Use your pointer light, searching for the three bright stars that form a triangle. Don't get discouraged. It might help to look at sections of the star field instead of the entire area. Or you might just let your eyes relax and take in the whole scene while your mind searches for the triangle. These three stars make up a pattern more famous than many constellations. The pattern is known as the Summer Triangle. The pointy end of this triangle always aims south. Star patterns which are famous enough to get their own names besides the 88 constellations are called asterisms. The Little Dipper is probably the most famous asterism. Can you think of any others? I will list some others for you at the end of this tape. Now back to the summer what? <laughs> That's right, the summer triangle. The brightest star in the summer triangle is called Vega. What a beauty. In the star of night, it is blue, white, and shining bright. Vega is the brightest star in its constellation known as Lyra, and it is also the brightest star in the summer sky. This constellation... Lyra is supposed to be an ancient musical instrument, but it is not easy to see it in the star pattern because hardly anyone remembers what the instrument looks like. It is actually an old instrument and can be thought of as being a distant relative to the guitar or harp. When I see Lyra in the sky, it looks more like a rectangle that was pushed over so that the short sides are tilted about 20 degrees. Now back to Vega. Ever wonder why bright stars are so bright? It is because they are either very close to us or they are actually super powerful giants very far away. If a super powerful giant star were close, we would be able to see it during the daytime because it would be brighter than the blue sky. Vega is an example of a star which is fairly close as far as stars go since it is only 26 light years away. Next to it in the sky is an interesting star pair. If you have really sharp eyes and the night is dark, look carefully for a very close pair of stars. You see them? If you were to use Bushnell's spectacular and seven power binoculars, you would see this pair of stars, which we call a double star. Its actual name is Epsilon 1 and Epsilon 2 Leary. I don't know about you, Whenever I look at the stars, I start wondering about how far away they are. It turns out that the stars are so far apart that astronomers have to use units other than miles to measure star distances because miles are too small. Here is a model that might help you get a feel for these distances. Imagine that the stars, which are often more than one million miles across, were shrunk down to the size of elephants. The elephants then would be about 15,000 miles apart. Get the drift? I mean that stars are very far apart in space, even though they are big. To help to think about these great distances, astronomers invented a unit of measure that is more handy than miles to discuss star distances. The invented unit is equal to how far a ray or photon of light will travel in one year. That distance is called a light year, and it equals about six trillion, that's 6,000 billion miles. 
If you say it often enough, it becomes a very sensible unit of measure. Now back to Vega once more, which happens to be famous for another reason besides being the brightest star in the summer sky. A few years ago, space scientists were testing a specialized satellite called IRIS. The satellite was put into orbit around the Earth to search for objects which give off energy waves that humans cannot see or even measure very well from the Earth's surface. Think about it. The scientists just wanted to test the sensors on IRIS so that they scan the star Vega because it is so bright and easy to find. What they found was unbelievable. What a surprise. The information or data from IRIS showed that Vega might have a planetary system in orbit around it. Imagine the first hard evidence that another planetary system besides ours might exist, and it was discovered by a happy accident. Think of that when you next see Vega. I do. I wonder if anyone or anything is looking back at me. Well, I also wonder if I might not discover something like a comet by a happy accident. Believe me, it can happen to you if you get involved with doing and thinking instead of just tuning in your TV. Another bright star, Altair, is the southernmost star in the summer triangle. You find it at the pointy end. It's only about 17 light years away, while Deneb, the third star in this famous pattern, is more than 1,800 light years away. Phenomenal. If Altair is 17 light years away, then Deneb is more than 100 times further away at 1,800 light years. That means that Deneb is at least 10,000 times more powerful than Altair. Put it another way. If Deneb were at the same distance from Earth that Altair is, it would be the next brightest object in the sky after the moon, and it would be visible in the daytime sky. In fact, it would light up the night sky so much that Altair would be hard to see. We could talk about and observe the area of the Summer Triangle for years, but my tape time is short, and a lot remains to be said about other parts of the sky. But before we leave... I want to encourage you to create your own asterisms like the Summer Triangle because they're helpful to learn about the heavens. Do you remember what an asterism is? Right. It's a pattern of stars so easily remembered that they have their own names. If you make up your own asterisms after looking into the night sky, you might be surprised that other people have come up with the same patterns and names for their asterisms as you did for yours. Look one more time at the Summer Triangle as it's projected on the wall or ceiling by your star machine. Look at the stars that are near Deneb, star B on the summer constellation map seen in your explorer's guide. Notice that they extend to the middle of the Summer Triangle. Counting Deneb, there are six stars in this group. I want you to look at this pattern and come up with a few names for it. If one of your names was a cross, then we agree on that. This group of stars forms the famous asterism called the Northern Cross. See how easy it is? The last star in the cross, about halfway from Vega to Altair, is called Alberio. To your eye, it looks sort of dim. But if you were to look at it with Bushnell's spectacular 50-millimeter telescope, you would be wide-eyed with disbelief. There is not just one star, but two stars, which look like they are almost touching. You would also see that they are not white. The brighter star is a golden yellow, while the dimmer one is a greenish blue. Clearly, there is more here than meets the eye. Okay, let's look at the stars as projected through the fall constellation mask, which is marked with a B. Compare the diagram in your photon guide showing the great square with the stars projected by the planetarium. You might have to turn your projector right or left until the pattern on the wall looks like the pattern in the guide. It might help to know that the great square is east and south of Deneb. When I see the great square rising in the autumn sky, it looks exactly like a huge baseball diamond with second base well up in the sky and home plate closer to the horizon. I can even see two stars, which might be the umpire behind second base and the third base coach. 
If you want to test your eyesight, or if you have the 7x35 spectacular in binoculars, or the 50mm Bushnell telescope, try to locate a true wonder in the sky, not too far from third base in the great baseball diamond in the sky. Imagine yourself standing on third base with both feet on the bag, facing away from the pitcher. The name of the star represented by third base is Alpha Rats. Sounds like awful rats, but it's spelled A-L-P-H-E-R-A-T-Z. Alpha Rats. Alpha Rats is the brightest star in the constellation called Andromeda. With your feet together on Alpha Rats, or third base, jump northeast and land on the pair of stars just ahead, putting one foot on each star. Continue northeast, jumping about the same distance again to another pair of stars, brighter than the two that you just left. Okay, now, with your feet firmly planted, turn your head and look a short distance to the right. There. Do you see it? A ghostly image just barely visible to the naked eye, much easier to see on a dark, moonless night, but still visible with your binoculars from a city. That smudge of light is all the human eye can see of a gigantic starry whirlpool made up of more than 100 billion stars. That's right, 100 billion stars, or 20 stars for every person alive on the Earth right now. This mystery object is called the Andromeda Galaxy. Billions of humans might have seen it over the last million years, but only in the last 50 years have we had a good idea of what it really was. Why is this galaxy so dim if it is made up of 100 billion stars? Well, the light you see from the galaxy traveled about 14 billion billion miles, or about two and one-half million light years before reaching your eye. No wonder it is barely visible, since the further bundles of light rays travel from their source, the more dilute they become to an observer. If we were twice as far, or five million light years away from the Andromeda galaxy, we would not be able to see it at all with our naked eyes. Now, wait a minute. Do you think that there are other galaxies further away than the one in Andromeda, so far that our eyes cannot see them? <laughs> you better believe it, star buddy. In fact, astronomers think that there are billions of galaxies out there in deep space, all invisible to our eyes, but binoculars and telescopes will help you to see them. This should give you a better idea of just how big the universe is. The technique we use to find the galaxy is called star hopping. It's a terrific way for beginners and even advanced observers to locate dim objects. Star hopping works by getting your imagination involved. Use all and any sort of mental hookups to remember where objects are in the sky and on that star map that you're building in your mind. Your star machine is an excellent device to help you connect the information found in other star maps and computer programs with what is actually in the sky. With practice, you'll quickly become an expert. Finding your way around the night sky as easily as you find your way around the neighborhood on your bike, skateboard, roller skates, or whatever form of locomotion you use. Our final heavenly exploration on this tape is into the star-rich area of the winter sky. You can zoom in on this area by using constellation mask D on the star dome of your stellarium. Of the 31 constellations projected by your star machine, or the 88 constellations visible in the sky of Earth, the six bright constellations seen in the winter sky are among the most spectacular. It just so happens that eight of the 30 brightest stars in the entire sky are found here easily visible from all parts of our country. Seven of the stars form a rough circle, while the eighth star is almost in the center. The common name for this group, or asterism, is the winter ellipse. Let's start with the brightest star in this group and work our way around the pattern in a clock-like direction. 
the brightest star is called Sirius. Like Vega, its brightness is due more to its closeness than its power. Sirius is the closest star to Earth that most Americans can see with their unaided eyes. It's only about nine light years away. In other words, if Sirius were to explode at this very moment, the moment that you're listening to this tape, you would not be aware of it until you were nine years older, the year in which the light from the explosion reaches the Earth. Look at Sirius when it's low in the sky. See how it sparkles or scintillates like a fabulous diamond, throwing off colorful jets of blues, reds, and violets. Maybe that is why people like diamonds, because they seem like captured stars. Eastward and above Sirius is another very bright star known as Procyon, only 11 light years away. When you see Procyon in the sky, notice its color compared to Sirius. It seems sort of whitish yellow compared to the, the whiteness of Sirius. Sirius is the brightest star in the constellation known as the Greater Dog or Canis Major, while Procyon is the brightest star in the Lesser Dog or Canis Minor. Continuing in a clockwise direction brings us to the two bright stars in the constellation Gemini. The first and brightest of the pair is called Pollux, and the second is Castor. Look carefully at them in the sky, and you will notice that Pollux appears somewhat orange compared to the whiter Castor. The twins, as they are known, point to the very bright star in the constellation Auriga. This star is named Capella. Early in the fall, you can see Capella rising in the northeast. In the spring, you can see it setting in the northwest. It sparkles so much at those times that some people confuse it with an approaching airplane. Look at it through the spectacular telescope at low power, 30 power, for a real thrill to see its photon fireworks. All of the sparkling you see is caused by the shimmering air of Earth, not by the star itself. Astronomers have found that Capella, about 42 light years away, is really two stars orbiting each other. Because it is so far north in the sky, Capella rises at sunset in mid-October and can be seen nightly until late spring. Below Capella is a V-shaped asterism called the Hyades, part of the constellation Taurus, the bull. Mythology tells us that the bull is very angry because he is locked in battle with our next constellation, Orion, the hunter. The bright reddish-orange star in the V is supposed to be the angry eye of the bull. This star, Aldebaran, is called a red giant star, and it is at a distance of about 70 light years from Earth. The last star in the winter ellipse is Rigel, second brightest star in the constellation Orion. Rigel is a blue-white supergiant star and is at the incredible distance of 910 light years. To understand better just how far 910 light years is, think of it connected to history here on Earth. The light you see Rigel by in the night sky left that star 400 years before Columbus discovered the New World. Wow! In the middle of the great ellipse is the bright reddish star called Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse, the brightest star in Orion, is a red supergiant lying at a distance of more than 300 light years from Earth. If you consider what was going on in history when the starlight you see Betelgeuse by started its journey toward your eye, you might be amazed. Those reddish photons left Betelgeuse at about the same time a young Edmund Halley was getting a look at a comet in 1682. This comet would later make him a famous man, and it caused much excitement on Earth when it returned in 1985-86. Did you see it? I hope so, because it won't be back again until the year 2061. Well, if you did not see it, here is an experiment you can try that might help you find the space pollution left behind by Halley and other comets. Think of comets as the polluters or particle generators of the solar systems. Whenever they pass near the sun, they're heated up and emit huge amounts, millions of tons of gas and dust. This stuff fills up the solar system and the planets sweep them up. 
When these dust grains made of bits of iron, nickel, stony material, or carbon hit the upper atmosphere of Earth, they usually burn up in a few seconds. If you were to see that happen, you might shout, Wow! A shooting star! While an astronomer might exclaim, Meteor! Just as excitedly as you. Thousands of pounds of this meteor material hit the Earth's air every day. A lot of it gets melted by its fiery passage into very small sphere-shaped objects called micrometeoritic spheroids. Wow, that's a mouthful. If you have any of the spectacular microscopes, like the 1200, 900, or 750, you can use it to look for the spheroids. All you have to do is collect the little devils. First, remember that they're constantly drifting down out of the sky, so set up collectors to trap them. Or you can search areas where they are naturally collected, like near downspouts, which drain the water off of roof areas. The name for that sort of discovery is serendipity. Serendipity. Scientists consider it a very important way of discovering new wonders. As we near the end of this narration, I would encourage you to make every effort that you can to observe the glories of the night sky. Take the rest of your family out with you. They'll love it. You're fortunate that you have your star machine just at the right time to learn the stars. That is, when you're young and charged up with curiosity and imagination. If you want to learn more about astronomy, there are many excellent ways for you to do so. Your library certainly has excellent books and magazines on the subject. There is probably a public planetarium nearby where you can not only learn and enjoy from their shows, but you and your family might find amateur astronomy groups which can help you learn more. Ask your teachers for other ways to research the subject. I'm sure that they can help you. You can use your postcard to write me and I will send you the name and location of the amateur group of astronomers nearest your home. Okay, now for some of the asterisms that I promised you. The Big Dipper, part of Ursa Major. The W in Cassiopeia. The Seven Sisters or Pleiades in Taurus. The Teapot in Sagittarius. The Circlet in Pisces, Three Leaps of the Gazelle in Ursa Major. If you can think of any others, send them to me along with your blast-off membership, and I will try to publish them along with your name in the newsletter. All of us at Bushnell and Bausch and Loam wish you happy star hunting and good observing. So long for now. <laughs>